I was thinking about this morning, I have a good friend named Randy who is one of the U.S. missionaries that we support. He's a missionary to Native Americans. He spent a season of his life, him and his wife, up in Alaska. And they were up in Kotzebue, Alaska. We were up there uh, years ago with him for about a week to do ministry uh, with the Eskimo people. And it just had an amazing week. And one of the things he did was took us on quads, and we rode up the ocean, along the ocean, and there were some cliffs that are maybe, uh, maybe 75 feet high. And as you're going along the ocean, what happens when the storms come, the, and the people there actually pray for storms, because when the storms come, they crash against this wall, and it knocks down a lot of the dirt, just caves out. They call it a blowout. And there'll be like a big section that will blow out into the ocean, and then they go in and they start looking for bones and, and things that they can use to carve on and stuff like that. And it's a, a part of their income. So they like when the storms, they pray for storms. And uh, I think, boy, it's a, a funny place when, when you think about the storms in life. Well, Randy went through a bad season. His wife had been diagnosed with a, a cancer, just a real struggle in his life. He couldn't pay the medical bills, couldn't even pay. He needed $6,000 for the deductible on his insurance. And he told his wife, after a storm, I'm just going to go for a ride. And he went up the ocean and went miles up the ocean. Well, he came across one of those blowouts on the ocean. And as he was praying, he said, God, I don't have money. I don't have help. I don't know what I'm going to do. Just discouraged. And he gets on, that, on the blowout. He just starts walking around, notices something sticking out. And he begins to uncover it, and when he does, he unearths a woolly mammoth tusk, completely intact. It was over eight feet long. We've got a picture, but we can't, this is the only picture I could uh, pull up on my phone. He brought it home and put it in his bathtub, and that's only the bottom half. He was cleaning it off in his bathtub, thinking, I can't believe it. God, this is amazing. And what he found, a guy in his church found out about it. He needed $6,000. The guy didn't know this, but he said, hey, I'll give you $6,500 cash right now for that woolly mammoth test. He said, I'll take it. And uh, it's just one of those answers to prayer in a for him. And he just said, thank you, Lord. I remember putting a post on Facebook, social media, just thanking the Lord for uh, just the small miracles that happen in our life. So sometimes when the storms come, they can be a great blessing. So just stay steadfast and just know that Jesus, at the right point, he can calm the storm and he can make a way forward for you. I was thinking a story today. There was a man who actually went to confession. He was part of the Catholic Church and he went to the priest and he said, Father, my conscience is really bothering me because I have been stealing supplies from the lumber yard where I work. I've been stealing supplies for years. And the priest said, well, well, what did you take from the lumber yard? And he said, well, he said, I took enough lumber to build my house. I took enough lumber to build both of my son's houses. I took enough lumber to build my garage. And I'm just feeling really bad about it. And the priest said, well, boy, this is really serious. I'm going to have to think about what your penance is going to have to be about this. And as he thought about it, he said, have you ever done a prayer retreat? And the man said, no, but if you get me the plans, I can get you the lumber. <laughs> uh, it, it's great to have a clear conscience in life. How many of you like having a clear conscience when you go to bed at night? It helps you sleep at night just to have peace in your heart. Well, in our series that we are going through in the book of Acts, Paul voluntarily goes back to the place of conflict. He's under the leading of the Holy Spirit. He has now been arrested as we went through in the last couple weeks. The Roman governor is trying to figure out the crime that has been committed. So he decides to have Paul appear before the Jewish Supreme Court, basically the Sanhedrin, so that they might tell the Roman commander uh, what the charges are and why is this man guilty and why should he be punished. So we pick up our study in the book of Acts in chapter 22 and verse 30. It says, on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. In, in chapter 23 and verse 1, looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Paul is looking 
intently at the council. He is staring at them with a, a great confidence. And that is the advantage of a good conscience. There is a confidence in a person's life when they know that they are right before God. We were at a, a men's uh, retreat this weekend with about 40 of our guys. Any guys here this morning, you're at the man camp this weekend, had a great time. Lord did some great things up in Prescott at the camp. And uh, one of the guys came up to me, uh, not from here, but another church. And he said, Lee, would you pray for me? He goes, I just can't get rid of the shame that I feel of my past. And I just told him, hey, God can deliver you of that. He can heal your conscience. And we started having a talk about that in our conversation. It, it's something that it, it's nice to be right before God. But Paul begins his defense with these by saying the word brothers. And if you think about that, at one time, Paul was serving with them. These are the men that, that he was one of them. He studied with them. He knew them. Uh, he was with them. He wasn't an unfamiliar face. He was somebody that knew these guys. And it's not the only time in Scripture that Paul talks about conscience. It appears many times in the New Testament, and that's what I want to share with you this morning, my message of living with a good conscience. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, he says, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. In 1 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul said, my conscience is clear. Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, he said, I serve God with a clear conscience. We live in a day today when secular counselors and psychologists are, are really less concerned with understanding the conscience than they are with attempting to silence it. Some say that, hey, don't, don't feel guilty. Guilt is a bad thing. It's not your fault. You should not feel bad. There are people that talk against the Bible, those who don't believe in the Bible and don't believe that it's the Word of God. The conscience, though, is a God-given innate ability placed inside each person that helps them to sense the difference of right and wrong. Every person, including the most wicked one that you can imagine, has a conscience. It may not be functioning, but everybody is born with a conscience. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter two, when outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Their response to God's yes and no will become public knowledge on the day God makes his final decision about every man and woman. In other words, conscience in us encourages us to do what's right, and it restrains us from doing what we believe is wrong. Conscience is not the voice of God. I think you need to also understand that. It's not the voice of God. It's not the voice of the devil. Conscience is a human faculty that judges our thoughts, our actions, and our standards by the highest standards that we perceive. When a person violates their conscience, it triggers feelings of shame, or guilt, or anguish, regret, anxiety, fear, and, it, and if the violation of conscience is not addressed in life, it paves the way for greater sinfulness and greater emotional confusion. You've got to deal with your conscience. You can't sleep at night when you have a guilty conscience. There's just, you can't rest. But when a person listens to their conscience, it can bring joy and peace and self-respect, it brings well-being, it brings gladness, and with all that, we must understand, though, that the conscience is not infallible. It's not perfect in every way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. What does he mean by that? The, the conscience does not always reveal right from wrong. It cannot teach you right from wrong. It can only hold you accountable to the standard that you know in your life, that you've learned or been taught and been educated 
that's in your life. Why was a good conscience important for Paul? Because he was making really difficult decisions in a complicated environment. He was dealing with people that were definitely not looking out for his best interest. They wanted to take his life from him. What do you think of when you think of a good conscience? What do you think of in your life when you think of, of conscience? I think if you think back, you might think, well, it's maybe the cultural Jiminy Cricket from the story of Pinocchio. You know, or you think of the little cricket that's trying to help you understand what's good and what's bad, you know, sitting on your shoulder. Or is it the clinical perspective that it's simply whatever your culture taught you in the formative years of your life uh, with no objective truth. What is it when you think of when you think of conscience? Well, Scripture gives us a biblical perspective on conscience, and we want to look at that this morning. Number one, God placed a conscience in every person. Paul states every person has a God-given moral compass that bears witness to the glory of God. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, says they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Secondly, there is a defiled conscience. Paul states that in a fallen world, every one of us has a broken conscience that we can override. It can be broken. To the pure, all things are pure, it says in Titus, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Speaks of that defiled conscience. The more that we ignore our God-given conscience, the easier it becomes to ignore it in the future. To the point that we can even sear, the Bible talks about having a seared conscience. We can even sear our conscience which is disabling our ability to even distinguish between right or wrong. Have you ever met somebody that's like that? You think they just have no idea, no concept of right or wrong. Well, they did at some point, but over time, it becomes like a seared conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the later times some will depart from the faith, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. It's a dangerous thing to leave sin in your life unchecked or undealt with or unforgiven. You would never want to get to that point where you would have that seared conscience where you are no longer able to distinguish between right or wrong. Thank the Lord we have the Bible and the Holy Spirit that helps us in those moments in our life. We also have, number three, a redeemed conscience. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He helps us in our conscience. As Christians, our God-given conscience is made new and puts us, it really puts inside of us a strong desire to be like the one who saved us. Jesus also promises us that we are not alone in this effort, and he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us maintain and to help us grow and to mature our pure conscience before the Lord. Thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit that speaks to us. In John chapter 16 and verse 6, he says, But because I have said these things to you, Jesus said, Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. We have the Holy Spirit today to help us. And he didn't say that at some point I'll take the Holy Spirit away from you and it's, only, and it's not just while the apostles were on the earth. He sent the Holy Spirit until he comes again. He has not returned again, but the Holy Spirit is still here to help us, empower us, convict us, help us when we're getting off track a little bit, to guide us back into, help us with our conscience uh, at times that we need that in our life. 
heard the story of a shoplifter that uh, wrote to a department store saying, I, I've become a Christian and I can't sleep at night because I feel so guilty about the money that I stole from you. So here's $100 that I owe you. He signed his name and then he added a little P.S. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest of it. <laughs> As believers, we don't have the proverbial Jiminy Cricket on our shoulder or the cartoon angel on our shoulder for our conscience. We have the Holy Spirit who leads us into the fullness of maturity of having the character of Jesus. We are becoming like Christ all the time and, and the Holy Spirit helps us. We also have the Word of God that reveals uh, the, the truth and challenges us in areas that we need to build up our character. So how do you clear a guilty conscience? As believers, I think it's pretty clear. We'll talk about that in a moment, what needs to be done in our life. But for one American, it meant repaying his debts by returning nine cents to the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> for another, it meant sending the government $155,000. In fact, for more than 200 years, you may not know this, the, the federal treasury has had a place for those with a guilty conscience to send cash and perhaps absolve them of their sins, and it's known as the conscience fund. It still exists today in our federal government, the conscience fund. Some people are surprised to learn about the fund, but Ryan Hanna, one of the fund's managers, told Business Insider that people have donated because they've stolen supplies while in the military, they've withheld payments to the IRS, or just found cash lying in the street, all because the thought of keeping someone else's money has burned a hole in their conscience. They just can't live with themselves. And it began in 1811. People send donations anonymously by sending in money, uh, money orders, cashier's checks, some even just stuff cash. They'll send it through relatives or attorneys. Uh, just put cash in an envelope and send it in. When the largest donation was made that they had received to date in 1990, it was $155,000 that somebody sent in and uh, the treasury, of course, accepts the money without question. <laughs> the past years, in fact, the fund is said to have five point, as much as $5.7 million of people with a guilty conscience that are sending their money into the government trying to find a way to find peace in their conscience. Let me just give you some keys to help train your conscience or maybe to clear a guilty conscience if that would be the case for you. Number one, confess and forsake your known sin. Examine your guilt feelings in light of Scripture. If we confess our sins, it says in 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you thankful that He's cleansed us, cleansed us from all unrighteousness in our life? If the guilt that you feel is not in God's Word, then we need to train our conscience. We can train our conscience. Actually, ask God to reveal to you unknown sin. We are all capable of doing something unintentional or displeasing to the Lord. It's kind of like the Apostle Paul. We read in his story, if you remember, before his uh, road to Damascus experience and his conversion to Christ, he thought in good conscience he was living for the Lord. He was persecuting the, the Christ followers at the time. He was dragging them off to jail and beating them and thinking he was doing a good thing for God. That's how he can stand before the Sanhedrin and say, up to this day, I live with a good conscience. But what he was doing, even though he had a good conscience, thought he was doing what was right, when Jesus came and blinded him, and you remember the story that we went through, all of a sudden he realizes and come to revelation, what I was doing was wrong. I was actually persecuting the Son of God. Psalms chapter 139 and verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way or wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David understand, hey, I'm not perfect. I don't understand all the right ways of God. Lord, I need your help. Lead me in the right way, because I don't want to do things 
even with a good heart unintentionally that would be wrong or violate the things in Scripture. Number two, ask forgiveness of those you have wronged. If you've sinned against someone, just make it right. It's hard to sleep at night. It's hard when you're, you're guilty and you know you've offended somebody, and it, it's just so easy. I don't know why people sometimes make it so difficult. Just go and ask forgiveness. Hey, I am sorry. Will you please forgive me? And immediately healing comes and freedom comes in that circumstance. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23 so, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and, rem and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. I think there's some of you maybe right now, you've had those experiences and, and we have them throughout life. It, 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 I mean, there's going to be times that we're going to do something thinking, I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I said that. Would you please forgive me for saying that or doing that? It just happens all the time. In fact, you may be thinking of something right now of a circumstance. You're thinking, I need to go to that friend or neighbor or family member or somebody and just ask their forgiveness because I feel bad about what I said because I know it hurt them or I know it created a, a rift between us or some division between us. Number three, we need to make restitution. Don't just make it right. Make it better than it was. In the Old Testament, if you wronged someone, you had to make it right and then add 20% to it if you took something from somebody. You give them what you took and add 20% and give them more than what you took. Genuine repentance wants to make things right. And you're willing to do whatever it takes to make it right. If you tell someone a lie, go and make it right. There was a man named Alfred Noble who was born early in the early 1800s. He was the man who invented dynamite. And he sold it to several uh, nations who used it not for the reason that it was created, but they used it to kill a lot of people. And it really bothered Alfred, and he had a really guilty conscience because of the lives that were lost, and he felt responsible for those people that had lost his life. It bothered his conscience. He felt very guilty about it. Well, one day Alfred woke up uh, in, in the morning and he was in his uh, 60s at the time. It was in the late 1800s and he did what he did most days. He got up and got the newspaper, sat at the kitchen table and he's reading the newspaper. And when he got to the obituaries, to his surprise, he read his own name in the obituaries. I mean, you know, it's a bad day if you read your own name in the obituaries. <laughs> and uh, his brother had died a week earlier, and instead of listing his brother's name, they put Alfred's name in the obituary. So not only did they mistake the name, but they also mistake, uh, mistakenly quoted what his brother did. They spoke of Alfred when they said, the merchant of death is finally dead. He will forever be remembered as the merchant of death. Alfred saw what people would remember him as and seeing what his legacy would be if he was really dead. Not only did he have a, a bad conscience, now he's got this legacy that he thinks is going to haunt him the rest of his life. So from that moment he on, he decided to do something about his guilty conscience and he changed his legacy. In the last 10 years of his life, he put all of the money that he made from selling dynamite into a trust fund and he said, I want to be remembered as a man who brought peace and not destruction. I am going to name this trust fund after my last name, which is Noble, and I'm going to give every person who does something to promote peace on our planet the Noble Peace Prize Award. So we know that hundreds of years later, people are still given the Noble Peace Prize for bringing peace to our planet. He dealt with his guilty conscience and changed his leg legacy. And he later said every man ought to have a chance to correct his obituary in midstream and write a new one. Let me just tell you, you can't change the legacy that you've been given, but you can change the legacy that you leave. Maybe you think up to this point in life, I don't like what I'm leaving, I don't like what I've been doing, I don't like uh, my past up to this point, but you can make a decision to change your future.
you can make a determination to say, I'm not going to live and, and give in to what my life has been up to this point. I'm not going to be marked or remembered because of my life up to this day. I'm going to be remembered for what I'm going to do from this day forward and going on in Christ. Number four, don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate in clearing your wounded conscience. It's harder the longer that you wait. It's harder to ask forgiveness. It's harder to give. It's harder to speak to those people that we've offended. And I'm gonna tell you, your conscience will not clear over time unless it gets to a point that it becomes seared. If you don't do what it's right, it can generate feelings of anxiety and depression. It can even cause physical and emotional problems in your life. Number five, educate your conscience. Don't encourage people to sin against their conscience. You need to educate, be educated what's right and wrong. And let me just encourage you, don't expect others to live just like you. Sometimes God speaks to you not to do something in your life. Maybe it's just a personal, there, there's some things that are biblical or universal sin. There's some things that are a personal sin. If God has asked you not to do something because he knows it's not gonna be beneficial for your life, for you to go and do something he's asked you not to do is a personal sin. It doesn't mean it's biblical and it doesn't mean it's a rule for everybody else to follow. Sometimes we think we're, we know that it, what's wrong for us, we wanna impose that on other people. And you can't do that, you're trying to make other people feel a guilty conscience for something that they're not guilty of. If that doesn't make sense to you, we find an example of that in Scripture where Paul writes to the Corinthians about the things we're free to do as Christians. And one of these was eating meat that came uh, from the marketplace that had been previously uh, part of the, the sacrifice to idols. They would bring the meat, they would offer sacrifice to the idols, and then they would take the meat back and eat the meat. And they're saying, hey, don't eat the meat that's offered to idols. But there's still the issue of conscience. Paul says it's okay to eat the meat in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7. He said, hey, don't worry about it. Um, but not everybody knew that at this point. Some people are still, at, the, at that time, were accustomed to uh, idols. And, and when they eat the food, they think it was having been sacrificed to the idol. And their conscience is what Paul talks about, having a weak conscience. It's untrained or it becomes defiled. But it's a matter of conscience. If you're, if you're going to engage in something that you think is wrong, whether it's wrong or not, and your conscience is eating at you, don't do it. Just don't do it. But that doesn't always mean that you're right. It could mean that your conscience needs some better training. You need some better understanding. It could be you're feeling guilty about something that shouldn't make you feel that way. Paul helped him to recognize that, hey, it doesn't matter. The idol's nothing, the meat, nothing happens to the meat just because it was brought before a meaningless idol. Go ahead and eat the meat. There's nothing wrong with it. But some people didn't understand that. So here's the point. You can't just let your conscience be your guide. You can't let your conscience be your guide. If it isn't guided by God's truth, it can malfunction. Your conscience might be wrong. Just like a compass can be set wrong, your conscience can be wrong. When you follow these keys, these are just a few keys to it. When you follow these keys, you'll become someone who has had their conscience trained for righteousness. Through a good conscience, Paul was able to be the best version of himself in the worst of circumstances. I think likewise, our best version of ourself is as a Christ follower who is sensitive to the difference between right and wrong. A thousand years earlier, before the time of Paul, David knew these same principles. In fact, he wrote in Psalms chapter 32, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. It's the same for us today. We're blessed when our sins are covered and our transgressions forgiven. David goes on to say, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. Can I just remind you, your sins have not been counted against you. 
If you've confessed your sin, and you've experienced the faithfulness of him forgiving your sin, he's cleansed you from all, everything, nothing left, unrighteousness, he's forgiven you all. In fact, in another place in scripture, he says, in fact, I've removed your transgressions from you as far as the east is from the west, and I remember them no more. I wanna tell you, forget about the sin of the past because it's been forgiven. Don't continue to live in it any longer. You've been freed from it, you've been delivered. Don't pick up those bad habits. Don't pick up those sinful uh, things in your life. Don't pick up the things that have tripped you up in life to this point. Let's walk in a complete freedom and a clear conscience before the Lord. David said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by the bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. God wants to bring freedom and maybe deliverance to your life today. There may be some here today that you've come, you're thinking, hey, I've been living for years with a guilty conscience. I don't like it. I, I wrestle with sleeping at night. I feel guilty. I feel shame. I feel embarrassed. And you think, how in the world can I ever deal with that? If anybody ever knew the secrets of my life, it would be a great embarrassment. But I want to tell you, you can confess it to the Lord, and He can, can forgive you. He can make you clean. He can deliver you. He can set you free. He can bring you peace. He can bring you joy. He can bring you comfort. He can bring you gladness of heart that you've never known before if you only confess to Him today. C.S. Lewis made this statement in one of his books, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes the pain we feel is a blessing of God because he uses that pain to turn us the direction that we need to be turned. But he can remove the pain from you. And I think for some of you, he wants to do that today. Would you bow your heads with me? I'd like to pray with you this morning before we go. And I just want to ask if there's somebody here today that you're tired of living with a guilty conscience. You'd like to confess your sin to the Lord and ask him to come into your heart and forgive you. I'd like to pray for you, but I'd like you just to raise your hand. Anybody that's here today, would you raise your hand and say, Lee, pray for me. I want God to forgive me of my sin. Thank you, young man. Anybody else, would you raise your hand? So I want to make Jesus Lord of my life today. I want my life to be completely changed in Him. If you've raised your hand, even if you didn't, just pray this prayer. It's a prayer between you and the Lord. If you would just pray, Father, forgive me for my sin. Lord, I've had a guilty conscience for so long. God, would you forgive me, come into my heart, remove the guilt, remove the shame, remove the embarrassment. God, cleanse my heart and make me new today. I pray in Jesus' name.